For a good portion of the 80s and 90s, the adventure game genre was one of the best-selling genres in the gaming world, all thanks to Colossal Cave Adventure, a computer interactive fiction or text adventure created in the 70s. This would mark the beginning of a genre that yielded some of the most memorable moments in gaming history. Enter Roberta Williams. Expanding on the web-based text parser of Colossal Cave by supplementing them with visuals, she and her husband would end up creating arguably the first ever graphical adventure game called Mystery House. Shortly after, the couple would found Sierra Online and release acclaimed titles such as King's Quest and Leisure Suit Larry. Sierra Online would later hire someone by the name of Jane Jensen, who would set a new precedent for adventure games to come with her seminal Gabriel Knight series of video games. The mature writing and dark themes in her games would be a welcome far cry from the usual comedic light-hearted affairs found in most adventure games of the time. Adventure games enjoyed quite the success with companies like Sierra and LucasArts leading the market by churning out quality adventure titles on a regular basis all the way up to the late 90s. These games would go on to be revered by fans all over the world, but critical success alone would not be enough to save a floundering genre from certain doom and as the 90s ended, so did adventure games. The general consensus of the adventure game community is that the very moment when adventure games died can be traced back to the release of Tim Schafer's Grim Fandango, which was a critical darling amongst gamers but did not sell nearly enough to warrant another attempt at the genre. One other game that I also believe marks the end of the golden age of adventure games is the one I'm reviewing today, Gabriel Knight 3, Blood of the Sacred, Blood of the Damned. Oh, and uh, heavy spoilers ahead, so if you haven't played the game and don't wish to spoil it for yourself, stop watching the video now. The rest of you GK fans, strap yourselves in for a long ride. Gabriel Knight is a series of adventure games created by veteran writer and game designer Jane Jensen while she was working at Sierra Online. After working under Roberta Williams on King's Quest VI Air Today Gone Tomorrow, Jensen was given the opportunity to lead her own project. This is when the first in a trilogy of games would be released starting with Gabriel Knight's Sins of the Fathers in 1993, written and led by Jane Jensen with a talented team at Sierra that included her husband Robert Holmes who did the amazing music for the games. The game would combine fact and fiction in a compelling supernatural noir-like thriller. The game uses a modified version of the tried and true point and click interface that had become the norm in adventure games by that time, but presented in a mature style with detailed sprite animations and cutscenes that played out like a graphic novel. Sins of the Fathers would release to an overwhelmingly positive response from the gaming community and would go on to win several awards in the industry for best adventure game. Gabriel Knight follows the story of the titular character who is a struggling writer slash novelist who owns a bookshop in New Orleans called St. George's Antique Books, where his assistant Grace helps look after the shop. Gabriel Knight is voiced by the famous Tim Curry in the CD-ROM talkie version and is not really your typical hero. He is a long-haired, blonde, blue-eyed looker with a heavy southern accent, which naturally makes him what you would call a ladies' man, much to the annoyance of his workplace counterpart, Grace Nakamura, who is an intelligent young lady of Asian descent who works with Gabriel in his bookshop. You might find it interesting to know that Grace is voiced by Leah Remini from The King of Queens. So as Gabe is struggling to write his next book, his friend Mosley in the police informs him of the latest in a series of voodoo related murders taking place all over New Orleans. Mosley is voiced by none other than Luke Skywalker himself, the legendary Mark Hamill. Before you know it, Gabe is involved in all sorts of occult and supernatural conspiracies and intrigues all the while discovering his past by learning about his ancestral history. He finds that he belongs to a German lineage of Schattenjägers that means shadow hunters in German and that he is the last of his family bloodline. The Schattenjägers have been historically hailed as the protectors of the world from supernatural evil, and Gabe realizes his true destiny lies in embracing his past, and with the help of his long-lost uncle, Wolfgang Ritter, decides to take on the responsibility that lies on him as passed down from his ancestors. The critical success of Sins of the Fathers led to a sequel in 1995 rather curiously called The Beast Within a Gabriel-like Mystery. This time, Gabriel has moved to Germany and is now living in his family castle that he inherited. Gabe's trying to overcome writer's block as he works on his latest book. He is suddenly distracted by a few locals who had heard that a Schottenjäger was in town and wished to seek his help in solving a series of murders related to what they claimed were werewolf attacks. Our reluctant heroes quickly dismiss such a premise but agrees to investigate on the matter anyway. Once again, Gabriel takes on a potentially supernatural case that leads him to various locations in Germany where he meets several interesting characters. Investigating the murders, Gabriel Knight would find that lycanthropy is all too real and that Bavaria's King Ludwig II may have been a werewolf as a result of suffering from the disease that may have been the cause of his madness. This clever blending of historical fact with fiction is what would define Jane Jensen's writing proficiency in her Gabriel Knight games. In The Beast Within, however, players were given the chance to play as Gabe's assistant slash friend Grace for the first time, who compensates for the investigation-heavy segments by adding a bit of nerdy researching on historical subjects pertaining to the case. 
But these are never boring as you uncover more and more mysteries culminating in the truth being revealed. Despite being attacked by a werewolf and turning into one himself, Gabriel Knight, with significant support from Grace, manages to solve the case by defeating the cult of werewolves once and for all. The third and the last game in the series is called Gabriel Knight 3 Blood of the Sacred, Blood of the Damned, and this would be the most grand entry in the series yet. That might just be my opinion, but hopefully you'll understand better what it is I'm trying to say by the end of the review. So without further ado, here's my review of Gabriel Knight 3 Blood of the Sacred, Blood of the Damned. Anyone familiar with adventure games would know that story is at the forefront of the genre. Everything else is simply there to serve the story in meaningful ways. Adventure games don't rely on quick reflex mechanics for their gameplay like in most other games such as first person action shooters, where a degree of skill and hand-eye coordination is required to be successful. In adventure games all you have is the mouse, the cursor on the screen, and a fairly simplistic interface that lets you interact with the world in various ways, most commonly by picking up items in the environment, using them or combining them with other items, talking to characters, etc. Gameplay tends to focus on exploration, puzzle solving, dialogue trees, and other such mechanics. Because of all the aforementioned, there is little wonder as to why story is considered as one of the most significant aspects of an adventure game, and Gabriel Knight has it in spades. In GK3, Gabe is invited to Scotland by Prince James, who belongs to the Stuart nobility. Tim Curry returns as the voice of Gabe and does a decent job of it in my opinion. But what he did in the first few games was just so much better. Anyway, Prince James requests Gabe to protect his infant son Charlie from what he can only describe as night visitors. Gabe agrees to the task, but in the dead of night, the night visitors kidnap the baby as Gabe pursues them to a local train station. As he searches on one of the trains, Gabriel is knocked unconscious by persons unknown and wakes up in Rennes Chateau in France. He books himself into a nearby hotel and learns that there is a group of would-be treasure hunting tourists and surprisingly include his cop buddy all the way from New Orleans, Mosley, and they're all staying at the hotel and one of them may potentially lead to the kidnappers. Gabriel begins investigating the local area for the whereabouts of the kidnappers and finds himself once again entangled within deep dark conspiracies, only this time the implications are more profound than Gabe could have ever imagined. An intricate plot of biblical proportions unfolds involving ancient theological feuds, blood-sucking vampires, the Knights Templars, the Priory of Sion, the Cathars, the Mystery of the Holy Grail, the Temple of Solomon, the Wandering Jew. I'm telling you, your boy Dan Brown's got nothing on my girl Jane Jensen. She was doing the Holy Grail, Divine Bloodline stuff before popular culture would make it mainstream. Anyway, Grace eventually arrives in Renle Chateau to help Gabe with the investigation by researching on the location of the Holy Grail and what it actually is. Grace is voiced by Charity James this time around, who also voiced Elaine Marley in LucasArts Escape from Monkey Island, although it was quite jarring to hear Elaine speaking in an American accent rather than her usual English one, but I digress. Anyway, she uses her new computer called Sydney to aid her in researching about the Holy Grail and many other secrets related to Renle Chateau's history. There are plenty of characters that you'll encounter throughout the game, each with his or her own motive that becomes clearer as you progress through the game. The character development of the story is fleshed out exquisitely and each one of them feels convincing and believable, backed by generally good voice acting overall. Most people don't like Englishman Tim Curry's overly exaggerated impression of a southern accent, but I think it's endearing in its own way. Wilkes, how's it going? Beachy. What are you doing out here? Just taking in the sights. Lermitage. Come to think of it, Tim Curry also did Gabe's voice in the first game and, oddly enough, it sounded much better and more nuanced there than it does here. So Gabe and Grace find out during the investigation that Prince James's baby may have been kidnapped by an ancient order of vampires seeking to attain divine power by consuming the life force of Jesus' descendants. Yep, you guessed it, little Charlie, who is the latest in the line of stewards, belongs to Jesus' bloodline, as does Prince James and all other stewards. After exposing a famous local viticulturist by the name of Montreux as the leader of the vampire cult, Gabe makes a narrow escape as the vampires try to hunt him down. Meanwhile, Grace is making great progress at the hotel using her computer city to solve the mystery of the Holy Grail by deciphering an ancient riddle known as Le Serpent Rouge. Sorry about my accent, but it's uh, Le Serpent Rouge or the Red Serpent. Grace eventually solves the elaborate riddle, learning other ancient secrets along the way, and marks a nearby location deep underground, the rebuilt Temple of Solomon, as the most likely source of the treasure. She is aided in her pursuit by a mysterious Muslim tourist by the name of Emilio Baza, who comes clean about helping Grace on her quest without her knowledge, and also reveals himself as the wandering Jew who consumed Jesus' blood while he was crucified and is now filled with shame and regret, vowing never to use his acquired powers because they are not his to use. 
Gabriel, Mosley, and Prince James's butler, Mesmi, enter the ancient temple through a cave entrance at the location provided by Grace. After overcoming a series of deathly traps, Gabriel reaches a portal from where vampires emerge that Mosley and Mesmi fend off as Gabriel makes his way through the portal to the inner sanctum where Montreux is preparing to sacrifice the baby. Upon seeing Gabe, he summons the demon Asmodeus to kill him. Gabe puts his family heirlooms to use, which consist of a dagger and a talisman representing the Schattenjägers, to fight the demon. Gabe defeats the demon by climbing on top of a nearby sarcophagus while warding it off with his talisman and, upon finding the right chance, slices the demon along the throat with his dagger, killing it. This in turn kills Montreux also, who dies where he stands, leaving the ritual incomplete and the baby unharmed. Mosley and Mesmi arrive at the scene visibly distressed, as Emilio Baza seems to appear out of nowhere. He then asks them to open the sarcophagus to see the truth. Upon opening the sarcophagus, Gabriel has a vision where he learns that an ancestor of his was one of the Roman soldiers who nailed Jesus to the cross, but upon realizing the divine truth, kneels in regret and begs for forgiveness. Jesus asks that as penance, he become a soldier of light against all supernatural evils in the world, which he promptly accepts, sealing the fate of the Schattenjäger bloodline. Emilio then carries the corpse of Jesus Christ, wrapped in a shroud, through another portal until he is gone. Gabriel and the rest return to their hotel where the guests are confused about what's going on. Gabriel heads to his room to check up on Grace but finds that her computer Sydney is flashing the screensaver and she isn't around, having left nothing but a note behind. Gabe reads the note and slowly walks away. The excitement of his most recent victory, gone. By the end you're left contemplating the feat of ingenuity showcased in Jensen's writing and only a strong scholarly understanding of the themes and subjects discussed in the game is perhaps the only way one can weave such a gripping tale of suspense and adventure set against such a rich historical backdrop. Jane Jensen's writing excellence shines bright in every Gabriel Knight game. I'll go as far as to say that the story gets several times better with each game. And Gabriel Knight 3 has the grandest one of them all that ends on a huge cliffhanger that hasn't been resolved yet which makes the desire for a fourth game almost unbearable for fans. The Gabriel Knight series is a rare one because each game is drastically different in its approach. The first Gabriel Knight game uses a traditional sprite-based 2D point-and-click interface. The second one uses the FMV format with live actors shot against the blue screen and later placed onto CG backgrounds. Dean Erickson from The Bold and the Beautiful plays Gabriel Knight and Joanne Takahashi from Babylon 5 plays Grace Nakamura and they do an excellent job in their roles. By the time the third game was in development, pretty much every game out there had shifted to 3D and Jensen felt that that was the only way to go with their next Gabriel Knight game. Bear in mind that adventure games had already declined to a very small share in the market that had moved to action heavy games like Doom and Quake. Needless to say, with each Gabriel Knight game, the industry grew and so did expectations. Staying on the cutting edge would be the only assurance that the game would sell. Hence, a new 3D engine for Gabriel Knight went under development. It took 18 months of painstaking hours to ship the game and the result is nothing short of a success, even if it didn't do well financially. Gabriel Knight 3 is rendered in full polygonal 3D this time around using a sophisticated engine built in-house at Sierra. The graphics were decent for the time, but they haven't aged too well. As you can see, the texture work is quite nice on the locations and even people's faces, but the low number of polygons used for their bodies can be a little painful to look at, especially when everything else looks so much better. What I really like about the graphics more than anything else is how expressive each of the characters' faces are. It's really charming how designers are switching between different mouth textures for lip syncing, and it's surprisingly quite accurate. Their eyes even have this subtle movement that adds more life to them. One other game that comes to mind that used the same technique for lip syncing is Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine, and I dig that game. The animations are also very well done for the time and move very realistically for the most part. Each character's personality is reflected in the way they move and it's also very satisfying to watch the occasional death animations that are so prevalent in Sierra's games because they're also very well done. I think where the graphics suffer slightly is when you're around organic objects like trees or bushes or mountains. Foliage in general was pretty tough to crack back in the day due to limited hardware capabilities and it shows here. The lighting in the game is really good and doesn't make the graphics look as flat. Call it nostalgia or whatever, but personally I think the graphics are quite decent considering how old this game is. The expressions of the character's faces read really well and you can clearly tell what emotion that character is feeling based on their expression. So yeah, I think the graphics still look pretty good to this day. Besides the occasional pixelated textures or low poly models here and there, the art style and aesthetic is top notch. Every location is faithfully recreated to its real life counterpart. The church in Renle Chateau for instance is remarkably accurate to the actual church. To give you an example on how effective the graphics are, I was playing this game one day and someone walks in my room and goes, hmm, looks like France. 
I knew then and there that the designers had done a tremendous job recreating these real world locations. I get really immersed in the setting myself probably because I spent a good portion of my childhood in Paris and I might have a weird nostalgic association with it. Nevertheless, the graphics are pretty neat overall. GK3 probably plays most differently from its predecessors, mostly because the market has shifted from 2D games to 3D. Hence, Jane Jensen and her team at Sierra thought it appropriate that the game feature a cutting-edge 3D engine to stay on par with market expectations. The first game employed the traditional point-and-click interface using a dump cursor that is a cursor that switches between different verbs like look, walk, take, use, give, talk, etc. The second game employed the full motion video format, or FMV for short, where live actors are shot against a blue screen and then later in post added to the game. Gabriel Knight 3, however, has a completely different approach as you'll see. Gabriel Knight is seen by the player from third person perspective and the game gives you a completely free roaming camera that you can take pretty much anywhere and set at any angle, kind of like a god's eye view. You can control the camera either by keyboard or mouse, but I find that using the mouse is far easier than using the arrow keys on the keyboard to move through the world. Clicking on a walkable area moves Gabriel Knight to that place. One interesting thing that I find when moving around is whenever the character is not in view, he will instantly teleport behind the camera upon moving. This is done to save time but me moving from place to place and keeps the pace of the game going. Interacting with objects is simple and intuitive. The mouse cursor lights up whenever it hovers over an object of interest or hotspots. Clicking on the hotspot will show a bunch of contextual icons that you can select to perform a number of actions such as zoom in, look, use inventory item, or other actions that might be specific to certain objects or situations. Interacting with characters is done the same way where a player clicks on a specific character and chooses the talk icon. Players can choose what they talk about by selecting different dialogue icons that show up. Each icon represents a different subject that you can engage in. Any adventure veteran knows that every dialogue option must be selected because there might be a clue in there somewhere that you don't want to miss. Right clicking the mouse button reveals the options menu where you can tweak the game settings such as sound, graphics, and gameplay. You can also access your inventory from here by clicking on the backpack icon. This is where you can examine all the objects that you pick up throughout the game. There is even a hint option that is sometimes available at specific points in the game that provides additional insight on what you should be doing. These hints are never invasive to the core game and its puzzles and at most are just there to simply point you in the right direction. There are a variety of exotic locations that the player will visit throughout the game. These range from a train station to a hilltop to a local vineyard and many other interesting sites. You will control Gabriel through most of the game as he investigates the kidnapping. Gabriel's play style is very heavy on detective elements. You will have to ask questions, go around different locations, and solve various puzzles. Players will eventually be given control of Grace. She plays differently from Gabe in the sense that she might do things that Gabriel may not approve and vice versa. It gives a nice change of gameplay as you figure out what each character would do in different situations and the kind of problems or puzzles you'll encounter. Speaking of puzzles and adventure games, GK3 is one of those rare games that contains both the greatest and the worst puzzle ever made in the history of adventure games. Let's get the worst out of the way. There is a puzzle in GK3 that is notorious among adventure fans as being one of the laziest and downright silly puzzles in the history of the genre. At one point in the game, Gabriel needs to find a means of transportation so he can venture into more areas. Gabe finds that there is a local moped rental shop, but he's not on the list of guests eligible to rent the bikes. So now, Gabe has to find a way to get himself the only decent bike in the shop, which is a Harley Davidson, and he's not having anything less than that. This is where things get weird. So Gabe finds out that his friend Mosley is also on the list, so naturally, the best way to get a bike would be, of course, if you couldn't guess, impersonate the guy. That's right, and it gets even worse. There is a cat you come across that squeezes through a hole in a nearby shack, so you have to get some duct tape, stick it in the hole, spray the cat with water, she squeezes through the hole once more, only this time she's left a decent amount of fur stuck to the tape. You retrieve the tape and voila, you've got cat hair. Next, you combine a packet of syrup with the cat hair to create a mustache piece. Then you have to get this ugly red cap from the lost and found section at the local museum. Then you have to ring Mosley out of his room from the lobby and steal his yellow jacket from his room. Now what you need is his passport. So naturally, you buzz him out of his room again, except this time you keep a candy on a table in the hallway, which distracts Mosley as he picks it up and eats it, during which time you get the chance to pickpocket the passport off of him. Yeah, now you have a makeshift disguise that you can use to finally rent that bike. But you're still not done, because now you gotta use a marker to draw a mustache in the passport picture. I know, what were they thinking? I have a feeling that a haphazard production along with meeting deadlines might have been the reason why this puzzle ended up in the game in the first place, which has been corroborated by the developers themselves. 
But strangely enough, I actually solved this puzzle on my own somehow back when I first played it in my teens. I've always been kind of good at moon logic now that I think about it. But all of this can be ignored when you realize that the main and most elaborate puzzle of the game is perhaps one of the greatest triumphs in adventure game history. I'm talking about Le Sopin Rouge, aka the Red Serpent. Grace has always been a valuable asset in Gabriel Knight's investigations. In GK3, she helps Gabe by focusing on researching about the history and origins of the Holy Grail. One major clue to the Grail is Le Serpent Rouge, an ancient riddle that's probably the best lead in finding the truth about the Holy Grail. Playing as Grace, players will use a computer called Sydney quite often to solve the riddle of Le Serpent Rouge. I just love Sydney. I love moments in games where you get to use a computer inside a computer. I remember a game called Uplink Hacker Elite that was designed from the ground up to simulate this concept. Another game that does this brilliantly is Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. You actually feel like a hacker when you're trying to bust security systems. This adds a whole nother level of immersion. The same can be said for Sydney in terms of simulating a computer inside a video game. Sydney is a sophisticated computer system that you'll be using a lot when playing as Grace. Sydney boasts a hefty database of articles relevant to the case that you'll need to look up to solve the dozen or so riddles in the manuscript of Le Serpent Rouge. You can scan different objects from your inventory as well into Sydney. As you progress, you'll eventually find a fingerprint kit. You can use this to collect fingerprints from objects and scan them into Sydney as part of its evidence database. You can even print fraudulent documents from it such as licenses which you'll need for one of the puzzles. And then there's the different software tools, for lack of a better word, that you'll use to crack the mystery of the Holy Grail. Sydney can help you find clues and symbols from various objects such as pictures, text documents, fingerprint data, etc. They even try to simulate the internet in this game. You can send or receive emails, you can look up various articles on the relevant subject matter. I think GK3 might be one of the first games to successfully pull off the illusion of all these things inside a video game. Sydney is a computer that truly feels alive. The Sopin Rouge is without a doubt one of the most elaborate and gratifying puzzles you can find in an adventure game. The blending of history, mythology, sacred geometry, all packed neatly inside one grandiose puzzle. This puzzle takes up a good chunk of the game, and rightly so, because it is indeed one of the most intelligent adventure game puzzles ever designed. Never once do you feel that the puzzle is unfair, everything is so seamlessly consistent in its resolve that by the time you're done solving it, you're left with an overwhelming feeling of accomplishment, as if you actually did solve one of the greatest mysteries of all time. That is a powerful feeling to invoke in your players, and Jane Jensen is a master at it. To be honest, I think more adventure games at the time that were struggling to overcome the dreaded polygon ceiling should have adapted the control scheme presented in Gabriel Knight 3. I think games like Grim Fandango and Escape from Monkey Island could have greatly benefited from this style of gameplay rather than the tank controls pre-rendered backgrounds that they went for in those games. You're playing an adventure game, not a survival horror. I'd say the controls in GK3 are quite intuitive and work really well especially in the capacity of an adventure game. The free moving camera is amazingly fluid. Too bad the game was released at a time and adventure games were on a steep decline in the market before finally hitting rock bottom. Overall, gameplay is solid with plenty of adventuring opportunities. The control scheme is quite impressive for the time and holds up really well. I've noticed plenty of modern adventure games employ similar methods in the way they control the camera or character, and that in itself is probably one of the many aspects of GK3 that I can't help but admire. One of the key elements in bringing the world of Gabriel Knight to life is the sound. The original game boasts an ensemble cast of characters featuring the vocal talents of Tim Curry as Gabriel Knight, Leah Remini as Grace Nakamura, and Mark Hamill as Detective Mosley. The second game was FMV, and Gabriel was played by Dean Erickson, and Grace was played by Joanne Takahashi. The cast in GK2 does an excellent job, if I might add. The third game sees the return of Tim Curry as the voice of Gabriel Knight, and Charity James as Grace Nakamura. There are plenty of voice actors that bring life to the characters and each actor has done a tremendous job in keeping the personalities distinct and consistent. One major criticism from fans was that Tim Curry's dialogues may have been too hammy, but personally I didn't mind the voice and it kind of made me like Gabe even more at times. Since each Gabriel Knight game uses an entirely brand new engine, the music in the game seems to have evolved with each iteration. The main soundtrack to Gabriel Knight was composed by Jane Jensen's husband, Robert Holmes, and it would be an understatement to say that it's one of the best soundtracks in adventure game history. I might sound like I'm exaggerating a bit, but listen to this stuff. It's even more impressive when you consider that GK1's soundtrack was all done in MIDI. Gabriel Knight 2's music, however, was at the core of the game's plot. 
and Robert Holmes did a fantastic job once again. I managed to score an interview with him which proved both useful and inspiring for this review. Here's what he had to say about the music in the first two Gabriel Knight games. The first game was musically about establishing some core motifs that could be used as legs on the table for the series moving forward. GK2 had such a specific musical need as it was woven into the plot that I had developed it specifically to suit the story as Jane and I traveled in Bavaria and Germany researching Ludwig and Wagner. While GK1 was more MIDI based, GK2 was all recorded in my attic studio on tape within two weeks of focus time. Robert Holmes would not reprise his role in full capacity for Gabriel Knight 3 and instead David Henry would take over in his place and do a fantastic job in revamping Robert's original soundtrack while retaining the same chords and motifs. Here's what he had to say from that interview. David did a nice job. He was sensitive to my style and musical tendencies and I felt created appropriate additions. If you want to read the rest of my interview with Robert Holmes, please look for the link in the description. By now, anyone should know how much I love the music from the game. David Henry's rendition of Robert Holmes' melodies are perfect in context of GK3. The splendid soundtrack spurs a feeling of mystery, intrigue, ancient legends and whatnot. A perfect blend of orchestral and sometimes jazzy tunes that bring the game a cinematic flair that few adventure games of the time could compare. The shift to a brand new 3D engine meant that sound had to work in this newly added third dimension. The spatial audio in the game adds an extra layer of immersion and is worked into the gameplay as well, as sometimes you might want to eavesdrop on certain characters or a sound in the distance might clue you in on something. The game does a brilliant job of giving the player a sense of the surroundings through various atmospheric sounds. Birds will be chirping during daytime, crickets cricketing in the night. The sound effects are top notch for an adventure game and with the amazing soundtrack to top it all off, makes listening to the world of Gabriel Knight 3 a treat for the ears. So in conclusion, I have to say that the Gabriel Knight series is up there with some of the best adventure games in history. I was introduced to the series at a very young age and I had played plenty of adventure games like Monkey Island and King's Quest up until that point, but I was thoroughly impressed by Gabriel Knight ever since I played it and each day I wish that Gabriel Knight 4 would see the light of day, but the rights to the IP lay with Activision and they don't seem to have any plans of return to the series because frankly there just isn't a very big market out there for adventure games. It's sad because Gabriel Knight 3, Blood of the Sacred, Blood of the Damned, leaves off on a very huge cliffhanger and to add insult to injury, there's a little easter egg inside of Sydney where if you search for GK4, it brings up an article on ghosts, which means that the next game that they had planned might have had something to do with ghosts or something. Jane Jensen even wrote an official graphic novel detailing the events after GK3 and let me just say it did involve ghosts. You can find the comic online somewhere if you're like me and really want some closure to the Gabriel Knight saga. I know it's a long shot, but I really hope that we see a GK4 one day. Please God, just one more game in the series. Until then, we can consider Gabriel Knight 3 as the end of a trilogy of adventure games that impacted the industry in a very significant way, bringing a certain level of seriousness and maturity to a genre that was mostly based on light-hearted fantasy comedies. Jane Jensen's writing brought a kind of gritty reality to the games that makes them not just great adventure games, but literary masterpieces. The Gabriel Knight series will forever be considered part of the greatest adventure games of all time, part of a legacy of great games that will be remembered by generations to come. Thank you for watching and or listening to my review of Gabriel Knight 3 Blood of the Sacred, Blood of the Damned. Until next time, take care.